We'll begin today's event and introduce our esteemed panel. Uh, before that, I'd like to share a few items. Um, please know that our events are recorded for the benefit of all participants, as well as those who were not able to join us today. Uh, recordings can be viewed on NYTA's YouTube channel. Liberty, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, to view this and past recordings, you can visit youtube.com slash New York Tech Alliance. Uh, for anyone joining us for the first time, the New York Tech Alliance is a nonprofit uh, serving the New York Tech community. At the core of our mission, we drive access, equity, and inclusion to make the New York Tech ecosystem the most diverse and dynamic in the world. Uh, to learn more about us, please visit nitech.org. Thanks to our annual sponsors who help make events like this one possible. Each has a presence on our website. You can learn more about them and how they support our community by going to nitech.org slash sponsors. Uh, and special thanks to GSD Solutions and team for providing the event platform, technical and production support. You can learn more about GSD and how they support our community by going to nitech.org slash sponsors underscore GSD underscore solutions. And our next uh, event is on Monday, December 11, 6 p.m. We'll be hosting uh, the New York Tech Meetup in our new home at Civic Hall. We have a fantastic lineup of founders who will be demoing the latest tech uh, that they brought to market. And uh, this will be followed by a networking and after party. Uh, of note, we'll be welcoming uh, Scott Heiferman, co-founder of Meetup. Uh, Scott will be providing uh, welcoming remarks uh, uh, to everyone and helping us kick off the event in our new space. Uh, we invite everyone here to join us and you can register at nitech.org slash our underscore events. And lastly, we love and welcome support to help us produce and deliver our programming. Three ways you can help include added donation when you RSVP to one of our events, become an individual or corporate member of the New York Tech Alliance, or simply make a small donation. You can do so by going to nitech.org slash support underscore NYTA. Okay, with that, I'd like to introduce Paul Ellis, managing partner at Ellis Law Group and one of the founding members of the New York Tech Alliance. Hey, Paul, thanks for being with us today and organizing a great discussion and panel. I'll hand it off to you. All right, Doug, thank you very much. And again, welcome all. Really pleased to have such a great turnout for this event. For those who are uh, regulars for our event, you will recognize that we have uh, topics on a series uh, uh, of issues for uh, tech com technology companies. We do uh, venture capital finance, we do formation, we do uh, how to pitch to investors, how to protect your intellectual property, uh, topics across a range. So uh, for those who uh, are coming on and have not been to our events, you can see videos of most of our past events on the Tech Alliance YouTube channel or on the events page of my firm website. And uh, you'll find that there's a lot of really good content uh, in those uh, in those videos. So we encourage you to, to go uh, uh, take a look. Uh, we've got a really great event today. Our title, Planning Ahead, Small Decisions Today for the Successful Sale of Your Company Tomorrow. Uh, we have a lot of good content lined up and we have a really outstanding panel to present. We have Jeanette Jordan, partner at Witham. We've got Brian Mizuguchi, Senior Financial Advisor and Portfolio Manager at Merrill. And we have Don Moore, Managing Director at Lincoln International. So uh, welcome to you all and uh, thanks, for your, thanks for your involvement. So uh, we are gonna to start out, uh, we're gonna go around the screen as it were, uh, quickly give introductions about ourselves, our organizations, and then we will jump into our content. Uh, so again, my name is Paul Ellis, managing partner of Ellis Law Group. Uh, we are a 10-person boutique firm that does a lot of work with startup companies and small to mid-sized tech and tech-enabled companies. Our clients are looking for us to give them cost-effective solutions so they can focus on growing their businesses. Beyond the acquisition 
space. We handle the life cycle of issues for startup companies, including formation, venture finance, intellectual property protection, employment agreements and equity plans, and general operations. All of our lawyers come out of top law firms and uh, major law schools. So we're able to offer big firm expertise with the personalized attention and the cost structure of a boutique. Recently, we've had a lot of clients joining us that were previously with big law firms, finding that our depth of experience with startups and venture capital finance uh, really uh, makes us a good value proposition compared to when our rate structure is compared to that of the big firms. So anyone who'd like to speak with me, feel free to send an email or I have a Calendly link uh, that will be in the chat. Uh, feel free to set something up in my office hours. Uh, with that, uh, I will turn it over to Jeanette. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Paul. And uh, thanks you everyone for attending and I appreciate the um, opportunity to be here to talk to you. My name is Jeanette Jordan. I'm a partner in Witham's Transaction Advisory Group. Witham is a top 20 national accounting and advisory firm. We have offices up and down the East and West Coast. Um, I've been with Witham for 18 years, been in public accounting longer than that. We don't have to talk about how long. Um, but uh, within our Transaction Advisory Group, we have about 25 full-time dedicated professionals that are working on deals day in and day out. That's financial due diligence. Um, tax due diligence, operational diligence, integration planning, sales side readiness, and support throughout the process. That's where we focus. And then, you know, across the firm, we have specializations in many verticals, tech being one of the more significant verticals that we have. So it's great to be here with you um, in that regard. And um, my contact information is there. And I look forward to the discussion. And uh, I'll leave it with that. Jeanette, great. Thanks very much and wonderful to have you. Let's go with Brian. Hey, um, great to meet you all. Um, my name is Brian Mizuguchi. I'm a senior financial advisor and a portfolio manager at Merrill Lynch. Um, Bank of America, is, uh, which owns Merrill Lynch, has been a proud sponsor of New York Tech Alliance for a couple of years now. Uh, so our team uh, works a lot with uh, high net worth clients and in particular, um, founders and executives of venture-backed technology companies. Uh, we work a lot with Bank of America's corporate uh, and uh, investment bank, um, especially the clients of our emerging growth and tech initiative. Great, Brian, thanks very much. Uh, you know, really nice to have you as well. And we'll wrap up with Don. Hi, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Um, my name is Don Moore. I'm a partner at Lincoln International. We're a global investment bank, about a thousand people worldwide. Um, headquartered Chicago, I'm in the New York office. I focus on cybersecurity in our technology group, and we primarily do M&A and fundraising for um, corporate clients. So it's great to meet everybody. Great, Don, thanks very much. All right, so <clears throat> let's jump in. We can go to our agenda. So what are we talking about today? So let you know to take a big step back, the 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 purpose of this event is to really talk about not how do you structure a deal, how what are the deal terms like, but what should you be doing one, you know, you know, 12, 18, 24 months out before a deal comes up in order to get ready for it. Because I think it's worth recognizing that when your company is being sold, sometimes you'll have control over that process and sometimes you'll have less control. I've had many situations where a client would say, well, we're planning to sell our company in two to three years. And then out of the blue, they get a term sheet or an LOI, which is a letter of intent, uh, that's you know at a price that's too good to pass up. So. I think one needs to recognize that you don't always have complete, you know, when the deal comes along, you know, you may want to grab it, even though it wasn't when you were planning to. So what we're talking about today is what are the things you should be doing well in advance of that point so that when the sale comes along, whether it's something you planned for or something that comes out of the blue, you're ready to go. Uh, now, 
I will note there's another event that we do, which is on how to structure a sale. How, you know, what does an LOI look like? What are the deal terms? We lasted that event in June. Again, you can see the video for that on the Tech Alliance uh, YouTube channel, on the events page of my firm website. Uh, that'll talk to you about, that'll talk about what do you do to put a deal together when it's in front of you. But this event is the long term. How do you, what are the things you do one or two years out to get ready? So what are we talking about? Um, we're going to start by taking a quick look at what the team is for a successful transaction. Uh, then we will go into strategic planning and alternatives. You know, so at that point, one or two years out, what should you be thinking about to get ready for a sale? You know, in terms of, you know, maximizing the value of the company, understanding what how your company is going to be valued, knowing what else is happening in the marketplace. Um, uh, then we will talk about, we'll go through the different uh, specialty areas. I will talk about on the legal side, uh, you know, what are the uh, legal issues you need to be thinking about for, to prepare. Uh, Jeanette is going to talk about accounting and tax, Brian, wealth management. Of course, Don is the one on st strategic planning up front. Um, so again, the focus is long range planning, uh, how to be, how to get ready in advance not thinking about any particular deal, but strategically, how do you make sure that you are ready for the deal, whatever it happens to be? And lastly, I'd point out, we're not gonna be able to position to give you all of your answers, but we want to sensitize you to what the issues are. So you know what sort of things are gonna come up at the time of an acquisition that you should be preparing for in advance. Uh, so with that, uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, I will uh, note that with respect to Q&A, we will try to do some Q&A as we go, and we will hopefully have some time at the end. Uh, you can put your questions in the chat. I can't promise we'll get to all of them, but we will certainly get to as many as we can, especially those that are going to be relevant to, uh, uh, you know, relevant to the group as a whole. So what does a team look like for a successful transaction? <clears throat> and again, this is something you, you should always be thinking about in advance. Well, financial advisors, that's you know, basically an investment banker, someone like Don, uh, who is in the business of helping, uh, of, of selling companies. Uh, that would be identifying buyers, uh, structuring deals, uh, maybe running an auction, um, uh, helping you in advance to understand uh, what the marketplace looks like so you're maximizing uh, the value of your company uh, for, for a sale. Uh, lawyers, uh, especially M&A lawyers, you know, not just any lawyer will do, but someone who does a lot of work buying and selling companies. Same thing with the accountants. <clears throat> someone like Jeanette, uh, who especially works in the M&A advisory space, uh, who is in the business of advising companies that are being sold, uh, that can give you, you know, deep expertise in terms of how to get ready for diligence. Uh, what should your uh, financial statements look like? Uh, you know, the, the various issues that, that uh, we know will come up uh, when it comes time for, for the sale. Uh, uh, your internal team, uh, not to be uh, forgotten, Getting a deal done is a lot of work. And it's something that it, it, if you haven't been through it before, you can't really appreciate how much work is involved in getting a deal done and how much it will take out of you and your team from you know, the initial diligence to closing and beyond. So you really need to know who your internal team is that's gonna be doing the deal. And also who is your team that's gonna be running the company? And this is something I, I always uh, make sure to focus on with my clients. There are going to be people in your company that are really going to be focused on the deal, but make sure you know who's really focused on running the company on a day-to-day -day basis. The last thing you want to do is start to ignore your operations and you start to miss your numbers because that could affect your purchase price uh, when, when, the, when the deal finally closes. Uh, and financial advisors. Someone like Brian, who works in the area of wealth management, because as we know, you know how much you know, the sale price is important, 
But what really matters at the end of the day is how much of that do you get to take home as opposed to how much goes to the IRS? And have you maximized that per, the proceeds to get the most value for you and your family? Uh, so that's generally speaking the team. Um, as I note in the bottom considerations, uh, along the way, you, know, you should be working with people that have deep expertise in the M&A space, you know, that the, the M&A is what they do, their experience in buying and selling companies, right size, neither too large nor too small. Uh, you know, you, you, I'll say from the law firm perspective, generally you don't want to be working with a solo because they may not have the bandwidth to, to, to do a deal. In terms of a big company, a, a big firm, there can be a place for them. It really depends on the size of the deal. Uh, but if the deal is not super large, you probably don't want to be with one of the biggest firms in terms of costs. So generally recognize the size of your company, the size of the deal, and make sure you're working with advisors who are comfortable and familiar working in that space. Um, and I've already mentioned about um, internal resources. With that, I'll turn it over to, to the group. Uh, any of you have, have things to add here? One thing I, I would highlight just at a very high level is um, certainly it's a lot of work to execute an M&A transaction, and that's why it's valuable to have advisors like the four of us to help you through that. Um, but from I also want to mention from a uh, mindset, um, a buyer wants everything to be sort of easy and uh, clean, meaning that if a buyer sees, um, you know, requests financial statements and, and the financial statements are readily prepared, if the data room is readily prepared, if there's a, a business attorney that is available to answer questions, it, it makes things easy and it raises the confidence level. So, which ultimately helps the price and the likelihood of a deal closing. So I'd say just from an a, appearances standpoint, having professionals guide you will make your life easier, but also will uh, sort of set the right tone and make buyers perceive that things are running well, that the business is solid, uh, that there's you know no um, no concerns and sort of makes everything go smoothly. So it's it's sort of, um, it's just a, a mindset, I guess, that you're communicating. It's just like a well-ordered house, right? When you visit someone's home and it's organized, it's clean. I think uh, it, it makes everything go easier. So that's um, just a point I wanted to make. And a small output in the beginning can have great results at the end as far as getting the right professional. Exactly. They, may, they might cost a little bit more, but they'll be well worth it. <laughs> uh, Don, I think that that's really true. And I that that general topic uh, carries over through a lot of what we're going to be talking about today, which is that you know when when I work with you know my clients that are being sold, uh, the cleaner everything looks, the more orderly everything looks, the smoother the deal goes. But if there are problems, especially problems that the buyer pick, picks up on before you, you know, as a seller, identify those problems, then they start to get nervous and they start to dig a little deeper and maybe they come up with other problems. So it sort of becomes, it's either a virtuous circle or a vicious cycle. So the cleaner things are, the better everything tends to go. The messier things are, the worse things tend to go. So make sure you're you're on the, you take the, 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 you're on the ups the upside of that of that uh, that dynamic. Um, all right, why don't we move on to our next topic, which is our strategy discussion? Uh, and uh, with that, Don, we will turn it over to you. Sure. Um, when you're building your business, everybody, I, I'd say I, I've worked with entrepreneurs and investors for 25 years and the one thing that they have in common is they ultimately want the business to do well to grow um, and to ultimately succeed and so a transaction isn't merely a way to 
sort of make money, right? A transaction is a way to achieve and further that goal, right? So um, if you are growing yourself, the business, you, you're the owner of the business, you accrue the benefits from that growth and success. If you're raising equity or debt, you're um, you know putting leverage on the business or you're giving away a piece of the business, it's because it'll help accelerate the growth and success and the maturation of that business. And so even though you're giving up a bit of control or economics, the result will be a bigger pie so that everybody benefits. And then with the sale of a company, you know, I, I often see it as not a way to exit so much as a way to accelerate the business plan, right? So if, you, if you're growing, uh, on your own at a decent clip, becoming part of a larger entity that has more salespeople, for example, and more marketing dollars will allow you to take what you've built and grow it a lot faster. So I think looking at it in that way, whether you decide to raise money or sell or recapitalize the cap table, uh, or go public. Um, it's all part of the same organic goal of pushing that business along so it grows and gets in a, in a bigger place. The question about when and how and what to do uh, to raise money or when to sell, I think this may be may may sound contrarian, but true entrepreneurs are not eager to give up control. They're not eager to bring other people on board. If they're successful, they want to just keep doing what they're doing themselves. And they want to bring people on to join the journey if they want to, but they're going to continue along that journey themselves. They kind of see the future. Um, and I think that mindset is is very helpful when you're when you're talking to potential investors and acquirers the question of do i raise money how do i raise money i mean there's a, a lot of questions but i think at the end of the day you have to have a clear vision of what you're trying to achieve right if it, you know from that big vision of growing the company, making it bigger, better, faster. Um, how do you get there, right? And the question is, um, where do I need to invest? Who do I need to hire? Uh, what, what do I need to spend? You know, the business plan. Um, that plan for how to get, that design for success, that pre-wiring for success is what you want to communicate to an investor or an acquirer and will dictate what you want to do. Um, so, I mean, unpacking that, it requires a lot of time and every, everyone's at a different point in their journey. Some folks are more sophisticated and further along, some are earlier along, but it's all under the rubric of, of how do I do what's best for my business and achieving my goals? And um, at the end of the day, um, whether you're raising money or selling, it all results in a similar process. You need to have uh, a business plan. You need to have your documents organized. You need to have an attorney. You need to have advisory assistance. You need to have accounting assistance. So it's all the, the nuts and bolts to get to that goal. So uh, th those are kind of the high level thoughts on that. Thanks. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, uh, so, any, any further thoughts here? Yeah, I, I think um, these bullets say, well, I, I think um, what you do and when you do it really depends on where you are in the journey, what's your market opportunity. Um, the most successful entrepreneurs um, maximize their optionality, right? So they may say, I'm not ready to sell now, but I'm going to build my company so that if somebody wants to buy it, 
um, I, I can sell it. Um, I may not want to raise money, but I want to right now, but I want to build my company to a level where investors will want to come and invest, right? And so you need to figure out how you're going to build out your story uh, in a way that um, it's almost like raising money or selling is incidental to that. You have your journey, you know, you're going to get there and you want to create the environment where people will want to invest um, and creating demand. Let's say you have the company, you've done all that. The company's generating revenues. It's, it's doing well. Then it's around creating a process and creating a process means um, creating a situation where if buyers or investors spend time with you, they know that the end result will be that they have an opportunity to submit a bid to invest or buy. They know that there is a endpoint. They know when it will be. They know what the rules of the road are. Uh, and they know that there'll be competition. So creating a, um, a process is important for that because otherwise folks may not know sort of how quickly do I have to move? What's expected of me? How much time do I have? And they also may feel that there may not be competition. So you want to definitely create a, a process. And that's what all of us around the table can help you do. So those are the high level thoughts. Uh, Don, uh, thanks very much for that. Uh, uh, Jeanette or Brian, if you've got anything to add, you know, feel free to jump in. Uh, all right. So I will, uh, let me, I, I, the other thing I, I want to say about timing that, that that Don sort of referred to is, you know, and I, I mentioned this before, uh, acknowledge, be aware of the fact that you may not necessarily control the timing. Uh, you know, deals happen when they happen. Uh, they don't necessarily happen when you plan for them to happen. And so that's part of what we're talking about here today is, and you know, all of these things we've been talking about fit together. You know, at, at, at every point, doing your best to have your company diligence ready, uh, to know what the market looks like, uh, and to know, you know, if if a uh, if there were an opportunity to sell today, you know, I'm ready to take advantage of that. You know, my, my company's in good shape. My documents are in good shape. Uh, I've got my team together. Uh, I I know what my competitors are doing. I know roughly what the value of my company could could be in a sale. Have all that information, all those pieces together so that when that moment comes, especially if it comes out of the blue, you're able to take advantage of it. So, um, all right, with that, uh, we will move on to the next slide. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about, particularly on the legal side. So, you know, I'm an M&A lawyer. So I spend a large part of my time uh, helping companies uh, either uh, prepare for a sale or actually get a sale done. Uh, and what I'm talking about here in these couple of slides are the things that uh, as M&A lawyers, we know you should be trying to think about in advance so that when the moment comes, you're ready. So things that I see that can be a problem. First one, founder ownership and voting rights. There should be no doubt about who the owners of your company are and how much they own and what their rights are. Now that may seem surprising, but uh, I have certainly had situations where uh, maybe there was a handshake deal early on, or maybe someone was sort of pushed out the door in kind of a sloppy way. You know, there are any number of situations that can create some doubt, some uh, you know, some some uh, question about exactly who the owners are and what their rights are. Uh, that is not a situation you want to be resolving when you've got an LOI uh, and you've got a potential buyer. That's the sort of thing that can really spook a buyer and can cause problems in the process and potentially tank a deal. Uh, you know, now it's it does happen early in the life of a company that there will be some fuzzy, sometimes some fuzziness or sloppiness in documentation. As much as I'd like to say, you know, I, that doesn't happen, it does. When I, I, I'll come into a 
company, representing a company that started without me, and there's some messiness about how it was documented. Okay, but the point is, take care of it early on. Uh, you know, once you've got the money and the team to fix it, fix it. Don't wait until a deal is done. Uh, get, get it done timely. Because um, among other things, if you don't get it done timely, and it gets, it has, you have to fix it when you've got a deal in front of you, that gives a lot of leverage to people that probably should not have that much leverage. So, uh, you know, as I, as I know, issues should be addressed early and in signed writings. Uh, a corollary to that is shareholder rights. You should have a shareholders agreement or operating agreement if you're an LLC. Now, the startup companies I represent will sometimes not have a shareholders agreement in the very beginning. That can make sense. Uh, but certainly, if you're venture backed, that issue will be resolved. If you are not venture backed, if somehow you make it to an exit without taking in venture money, it is possible that you could get to that point without having a shareholders agreement. That is not a situation that you want to be in. There are important provisions in the shareholders agreement or the operating agreement that will really matter when it comes time to sell your company. In particular, drag along rights, voting rights, again, to the same issue, same issue you don't want individuals, you don't want holdouts to have undue influence over the sale of the company. You want the rights to be clear and you want a majority uh, of, the, of the shareholders to have the contractual right to force everybody to come along on a sale. Um, moving on, contracts. <clears throat> there are any number of issues in your contracts with your customers, with your vendors, strategic partners, uh, investors uh, that uh, that can become important at the time of a sale. And it should be part of your process during the life of your company that you're working with your lawyers and when deals, transactions, relationships are getting documented, you should be thinking a little bit about what the what the uh, what the end game is. And if the end game is a sale of the company, and for many it is, you should make sure that things don't slip into those contracts that'll cause problems for you. So the sorts of things you should be aware of, uh, anti-assignment and change of control clauses. Uh, often you will have contracts that say, uh, if, uh, if the company is sold or if there's a change of control, this agreement will terminate. Now, if that's an important agreement uh, with you know, maybe a supplier or a customer, and it's going to terminate upon the sale of the company, and it's at advantageous terms to the company, that could be a problem because the buyer will say, well, that's part of what I'm buying, that contract. But that contract is going to, is going to terminate upon the, upon the closing of the deal. And so you may have to go back and renegotiate that contract, and it, it, the terms may not be as good. So the way to fix that is to make sure that your contracts at the outset do not have clauses like that. Uh, rights of first refusal, that can be a big one. An investor, if there's an investor, a strategic investor that wants a right of first refusal uh, when the company is, in, uh, is being sold, that can be huge. Uh, and I, that's a, a conversation I'll often have with my clients when they're trying to bring on a strategic investor. Long-term leases, you know, if it's a strategic buyer, they may not want your 10-year lease. Uh, and if you're tied into a 10-year lease that they can't get out of, that may affect the purchase price. Um, uh, uh, take or pay provisions, you know, supply contracts, same thing. If you're bound into a contract that you can't get out of, uh, that could be a problem. Uh, uh, unusual limitations on liability or warranty commitments, depending on what type of business you're in. If there's something out of the ordinary, that can also affect the purchase price or exclusivity provisions. But especially for a strategic buyer, again, that's going to be thinking about how do they fit your company into their overall framework, into their suite of solutions. If you've given away exclusivity uh, rights that prevent them from fully utilizing your solution uh, in their platform, that may limit their value, your value to them and limit the amount they're willing to pay. So 
Bottom line, these sorts of terms, if not thought through carefully, can delay a deal, lead to a restructuring, or affect the purchase price. Um, I'll, st uh, I'll st actually, if we can go back a slide, uh, I'll just open that up. Uh, uh, if any, the rest of the panel, any thoughts, comments on these points? Or was it so clear? We have, okay, let's, all right. We'll move on to the next slide. <clears throat> uh, uh, protecting IP. I will say to you that um, this is perhaps one of the most significant issues that I see that comes up uh, with my client base. You know, if I've been representing the company from the beginning, things should be pretty clean, me and my IP, my IP lawyers. Uh, but we'll often get called into a deal where we didn't form the company or a company that is now being sold and we come in as M&A counsel to get the deal done and there will be IP issues that come up. I will say that I, I don't, rarely will problems with IP tank a deal, but they can really cause problems in a deal. They can slow it down, they can reduce the purchase price, uh, or they can increase the costs to get the deal done. So the sorts of things that come up, a big one, problems with chain of title. Everybody who has touched the IP and has any role in creating the IP, their rights need to be signed over to the company. Because in the diligence process, the buyers are gonna look through and they are gonna be looking at chain of title. They're gonna wanna see that, that everything is tied down in signed writings. And if they see gaps, they're going to want those gaps filled. And that may be difficult if that's somebody who worked with the company early on, is no longer with the company, and you have to go after them to get them to sign some document. Failure to register or police IP rights. You know, speak to your IP counsel. Your trademarks should be registered. Your patents, if you have patentable rights, those rights should be, uh, you should have uh, patents in place or at least applications. Uh, same thing with copyrights. And you should police those rights. You should make sure that if people are infringing your rights, you go after them. Because if you don't, you may give up your right to go after them. And that will create a problem for, for the buyers if they're depending on that IP. Uh, open source software, another problem that comes up uh, that you know, the buyer will do an open, soft, an open source audit. And if they identify open source that you are not aware of that creates issues for them, uh, that also can affect the deal, it can affect the purchase price. All of these things, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll say this again, all of these things can, can be best addressed if you know about them in advance and can deal with them on a timely basis. Uh, you don't want to be figuring these, these things out at the last minute, and you certainly don't want the buyer to be figuring these things out at the last minute. At the minimum, you want to control the narrative. You know, there's always a problem. There's in, in every deal, there's a problem. Let's just take that as a fact of life. Um, but you want to know what those problems are. Do your best to fix them in advance. And if you can't fix them, you tell the buyer, OK, we've got this issue. This is what we're going to do about it. This is why it's not a problem. That's that's your best scenario. Don't let the buyer have an aha moment. You know, and their lawyers come running to them. Look what we found. Uh, so anyway, trade secret protection, uh, you should have NDAs in place. Uh, every, everybody who has access to your confidential information, there should be NDAs in place. Generally speaking, you should have a protocol for how you protect your trade secrets. So you don't, uh, you don't have any question as to whether you can rely on trade secret, trade secret protection if you need to. Um, and then inadequate protection of IP rights and agreements with counterparties. Well, this sort of goes back to what I was saying on the previous slide. Uh, as you enter into contracts, as you run your company, make sure you're thinking about your IP rights and your IP is properly protected. Personnel issues. Employees are always important. Uh, one issue that comes up, uh, startup companies are always using independent contractors for good reason, uh, but uh, you know, be aware that your view of whether someone is an independent contractor is less important than the IRS or Department of Labor. Uh, and the buyers will look at this issue because they know there's exposure there. So if you've been relying on independent contractors that are improperly classified, clean that up. Retention issues, another big, another big point. 
uh, make your know, buyers are going to want your team to be on board uh, uh, for some time after the closing. The way you do that is have vesting provisions on equity, double trigger acceleration. Maybe you put in place retention bonuses. Again, if you've been thinking about these things during the life of the company, things are set up at the time of the sale. If not, you've got to scramble. Lastly, corporate housekeeping. It's not the sexiest issue, but you got to get it done. You got to have you know, board meetings, your shareholder meetings, you got to get everything properly documented. Uh, again, it's not something that's likely to queer the deal, but if it's not in place and the buyer's council figures it out, then the people will start to get nervous. They'll say, what else is wrong here? They'll take a deeper look and you may have problems. Um, all right, uh, I'll open it up to the panel. If, if any comments or further thoughts on these points? I think you had a question, Paul. Uh, somebody asked to explain what you mean by open source software issues. Um, uh, all right, well, I'll speak to that just briefly. Uh, I mean, it sort of largely goes beyond this, uh, this topic, but uh, there is uh, software, uh, it's in the, in the public domain, uh, that, but it, it can only be used subject to, uh, subject to a license. Uh, uh, subject to an open source license agreement that puts limitations on uh, on on how it's used and may give uh, right uh, may grant further rights uh, if you use uh, if your company uses that software. So if you've incorporated open source software uh, into your uh, uh, you know into your into your company uh, in, into your uh, uh, your system, uh, you need to know it's there, and you need to know uh, what uh, what obligations your company has uh, as a consequence of having used that open source software, uh, and uh, that will th that can give rights uh, uh, to others uh, in the rest of your platform or your system, depending on the software and the licensing regime to which it's subject. Uh, so the takeaway there is uh, you, should always, you should always know if open source software has been used in the, 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 the system for your company uh, and uh, what the implications are of having used open source software. Uh, and I mean, that's really something that's sort of between you and your technical team, you and your IP lawyers, uh, but know about it in advance. Uh, the the worst thing is that you don't become aware of it until the company is sold and the buyer does an open source audit. You know they basically scrub your software and they learn that there is open source there that you were unaware of, and that that has that that creates implications for your company and for uh, for for your code going forward. I mean that's. I'd be happy to speak with someone about that further. That's really a topic for an IP lawyer, uh, yeah. which I'm not, but uh, uh, and that's a big uh, high level. Well, I'd add to that, by the way, yeah. So it's a licensing issue. So you may have a, a liability to pay licensing fees for open source that you used, but there's also security issue because when you incorporate code, you may incorporate a vulnerability. So one of the things that we're seeing more and more in deals is buyers want to do a security scan to make sure that your code is secure. Uh, they may do some penetration testing and there's, you're probably seeing Paul's a lawyer, more representation warranties sec section in the section there that there's a, a security rep, um, cybersecurity rep. So that's another sort of related matter. So. Yeah, I would say cybersecurity and data privacy has, you know, becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Uh, no, no question about it. Uh, th thank you for that, Don. Sure. Uh, all right, let's move on to uh, Jeanette uh, for uh, uh, accounting and tax issues. All right, thank you. Quite a few bullets here. I'll do my best to hit most, if not all of them. Um, in case you missed it, though, the overarching point of most of what I will say is probably something you've heard a couple times already, which is accurate and timely data is the best way to move a deal forward and get it closed in a way that you know, is easiest and most beneficial to everyone. The 
messier the data, the slower the delivery, slows the process, can erode value, can even crater a deal if it gets too bad. So along those lines, um, and when we're talking about long-term preparation, strongly recommend just taking a step back and looking at the accounting systems and processes in place. You know, if you're if you're a couple years, a year ahead of a transaction, or even just thinking about it, it's it's a really good time to make sure that you have strong practices in place. Uh, again, just to produce that accurate information and to be able to do it timely. As you get into the buyer diligence phase, they're going to ask questions. You're going to need to be able to produce information. You're going to need to be able to do it quickly. You're going to need to be able to provide updates as the process moves forward. And if you have a system in place that supports that, you're all the better off. Uh, along those lines, you also want the personnel in place that can handle it, that understand what's happening, know the data, know how to get the information, can speak intelligently to the buyer and answer questions. Um, interestingly, I was listening to a panel last night, a private equity director said how they, that they strongly, strongly prefer an outsourced accounting function in their, in their targets, which was interesting to hear. Uh, I, th I think they're just finding that the internal um, systems are not as strong maybe these days because of the difficulty of acquiring the talent to do it. Um, GAP, that stands for Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. Many lower middle market Main Street businesses have no reason to report on GAP. Um, but as you grow and as you consider a transaction, most buyers, I think, are going to want to be able to see the financials presented that way. Um, if you're cash basis, that can significantly change the presentation of the information. If you're doing some kind of hybrid accrual, it may or may not have um, implications. Certainly, the revenue recognition can be different when you're looking at GAP along with some other um, accruals that you might need to present. So to the extent that you're able to put some thought to that, get the financials converted in advance of going to market, again, it's just going to save a lot of time and questions going forward. Accountant prepared financial statements, taking those gap financials, having them reviewed, compiled by an accountant, or even better audited by an independent accountant is going to add credibility, especially you know, as you consider selecting who that accountant is going to be consider what's appropriate for your company, you know, a recognized CPA firm, somebody that's, you know, reasonably upmarket to, to have a name that's going to support, you know, the credibility there. Along with historical data, buyers are interested in, in pro forma data, in, in models and projections. They want to know what the company is going to look like going forward to the extent that you can put together a well thought out model that can show where you believe the revenues are gonna go and where they can come from, you're really gonna give that buyer a good jumping off point to support the valuation and, and to help model their own future as owners of the business. Keep it realistic, you know, no hockey stick projections on revenue unless you can show them the contract of where that revenue is coming from. Um, you know, keep it realistic and something that, you know, that they can uh, ask questions and that you can answer where those assumptions came from. Related party transactions need to be disclosed. You know, oftentimes they are not fair value or market rates. So to that extent, they, the buyer's gonna wanna understand if there's gonna be some different economics going forward when that's no longer a related party. And that could be whether, you, you know, you have a related party rent that's below market or anything like that, that you just wanna be able to get your arms around. I think we covered the cap table pretty well. They can, can get complex very quickly, but you really need to keep your arms around it to know how you're exiting and who has what influence on that process. And the same with stock-based compensation. You need to really understand the terms of any of those agreements, how change of control affects them, what it's going to cost you, um, and, and what implications that has to the closing process. Quality of earnings could be a whole nother day all by itself. So I'll keep it very brief here. Um, from a sell side perspective, this is very different than an audit. Uh, we love the audit as a jumping off point, um, but the sell side diligence is an opportunity basically for you to turn the microscope on your own company before the buyer does. Take a look at what questions they might come up with. 
formulate your answers, maybe make some corrections, some reclassifications. We do a lot of monthly trending that can raise a lot of questions if you don't have a good monthly cutoff, that kind of thing that will you, you'll be able to get your arms around. Um, but the ultimate output of the quality of earnings is what we refer to as normalized EBITDA. There's some rough rules of thumb around valuing deals off of EBITDA. So you want a normalized EBITDA, which means it's been adjusted for anomalies, non-operating income and expenses, non-recurring expenses. An example might be transaction costs that you've spent to prepare for a transaction. Those are not normal course operating expenses, and we would add those back to EBITDA. So there's a lot of things to consider there as you're as you're putting together your, your information for a potential buyer. And then being diligence ready can also involve really looking forward with your advisors and, and putting together a data room. Often the attorneys or the investment bank will host a data room for you online, gives you a place to compile and organize all the information you're going to need going forward. It can be deposited in there as you're going, you know, as you close a month, as you close a quarter, keep information um, refreshed and, and up to date. And I think from there we can go to the next slide. Um, we labeled this other considerations. Tax should probably have its own headline. Tax can be huge when it comes to a deal. Sometimes it's a non-event. Sometimes it can be a very significant event. It's influenced by a lot of different things within the deal. If you have a stock sale, if you have an asset sale, if the entities involved are passed through or if they're C-Corps, the tax may be more or less important depending on, on how everything is structured. But there's always something related to tax that you need to consider. Certain taxes will follow assets, so you're not necessarily out of the woods just because you did a stock deal. Um, it's just very important to take a look at internally, have you assessed your state nexus? Uh, there's been changes. They're not really new anymore, but they're still new to some people, it seems, uh, with respect to nexus for sales tax. Um, there's a thing out there called economic nexus now, which makes a lot more people subject to sales tax in states that they might not have been in the past. Um, the, I'm going to skip to the second to the last bullet, the estimated after-tax proceeds calculation. I think it was alluded to earlier, but I just want to really bring that home. A buyer, or excuse me, a seller might really be focused on what they think they can sell their business for, that top line. And that's an important number, but it's much more important to understand the cash at close. How much money do you want in your pocket when you walk away? And what number gets you there? You almost have to work backwards because you have to figure out how much you're giving to Uncle Sam, how much you're using to pay off other debt, how much you have to spend on um, change of control bonuses or other things that exist within um, the organization. So really important as you approach this process to understand what the potential takeaway is and what you really need to get out of it. And then talk to your advisors like Don and say, you know, is this even possible? Is this reasonable for my business? Can, you know, can I sell this for this amount of money so that I can walk away with, with X? Um, and the last bullet there, we just talked about cybersecurity and data privacy, you know, hugely important throughout the deal and throughout the business operation. Um, that's not my area of expertise, but I know we always talk about it. <laughs> All right, Jeanette, th thank you for that. We have one question. Uh, at what transaction size, as a general rule of thumb, would gap revenue recognition reporting be appropriate? Uh, the question was, was it, should that be a sale price of 10 million or higher or even higher than that? Um, I think that's probably going to be a little more dependent on who your buyer is and how big they are and what their reporting expectations are, as opposed to who you are. Um, so I think if that's another thing that you would want to discuss with your advisors. You know, who am I likely to be selling to? What are they likely to require from me and from my business? Um, because it's going to vary. And, the, you know, the smaller companies, like I said, there's no reason for them to be reporting on gap. If they don't have bank debt, if if you know cash flow is really their main concern for operating their business, so it's a big step to take that you need to think about, and I think it's really going to be about who your potential buyer is and what their expectations would be. 
Got it. Great. Th thank you for that, Jeanette. So your, your, your previous point about the after-tax proceeds calculation is a great segue to Brian. <laughs> uh, so why don't we turn it over to you, Brian? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, the way that um, this panel is kind of uh, constructed is going to, it's going to be like that um, when you're actually in the process. So there's going to be sort of like a three to one ratio of things that you're going to need to do for your company versus like time that you're going to have for yourself. Uh, you know, three to one is probably pretty generous. Uh, you know, these, these guys are going to give you a lot of homework and it's all, it's all to, um, you know, make sure that you're walking away with the, you know, the best possible uh, terms uh in a transaction uh that being said like you have to do what you know paul and don and jeanette are saying and if you never met with me you'll you'll still have done your transaction um you know you have a fiduciary duty to other stakeholders uh you know just do you have to take care of yourself to get the process done no you can just pay a lot more in taxes and just regret it later um, and, you know, I think it's, it's really easy to kind of forget yourself in the process. Uh, but, you know, um, really, I think, you know, uh, we, a couple of people have already alluded to it. It's, it's not really about the sale price. It's about, you know, what you walk away with, you know, uh, in your pocket, you know, uh, that you can use. And, um, you know, Jeanette said, okay, well, you need to kind of work backward, uh, to sort of think about, you know, what, what you need to do. And that's, that's really my job is to help people think about um you know what do you what do you really need uh out of the sale um do you need to walk away and uh just you know have a lump of uh lump sum of cash and, and invest it in you know draw a stream of income do you need to you know uh stay on and uh have a you know a stream of income and stay in the company there there's a, any number of ways that you might do it but you have to really think about what's going to make you happy uh, you know, make you feel like, okay, this transaction was worth my while. Um, and, uh, it's going to, you know, achieve my and my family's goals. And I think, no, you know, knowing that outcome really helps you do two things. One, um, it helps you sort of stay on track. I think, you know, it's a time that it's busy, it's emotional. Um, and I think that, um, you know, just being able to kind of go in with a plan is really important and i think also too it um helps you avoid the pro uh the problem of uh letting uh you know the perfect deal be the enemy of a good deal um you're not in control of everything so just um you know being able to understand you know when you've kind of like won the game that you're playing um i think that's really really important because it's it's really kind of easy to get caught up in what you think is sort of theoretically a perfect game uh so uh or perfect deal that is so um that's that's sort of uh from my end um so when you're you know when you're kind of uh going through this process i think uh my my two cents start your personal planning really as early as possible uh, a couple of reasons um one uh you know like i said you know the rest of these guys they're they're going to be giving you a lot of homework and when it's deal time you know you're going to be doing the deal you're going to be running the company and you're going to be doing every other thing that, you know, takes up, you know, the 25 hours of your 24 hours of your day. So um, just the idea that you're going to get around to, you know, meeting with uh, your financial planner and your estate lawyer and, you know, your personal CPA and anyone else. Um, it's just, you know, that's just one more thing you got to cram in. Uh, so just, you know, again, earlier is better. And then the other thing with early, too, is just there's more opportunities to, you know, make moves that actually make an impact on uh sort of the outcome of your of your uh transaction um you know the earlier on you're planning uh the lower the valuation is likely for your company the more options you have for uh you know for gifting for planning for for you know thinking about uh you know different different uh things that you might be able to do um so uh you know really i think just getting getting into the process as early as possible is really super important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of uh, you know what what do you need to plan for? Uh, everyone's going to have super different things. Um, you know, this isn't just just for the founders; this is for the executives of the company too. You know, uh, everyone's going to have sort of a different sort of set of criteria that they are planning for. 
Um, so, you know, I don't really have sort of general, you know, everyone can stick with it advice, but, um, you know, if we actually, if we go to the, uh, to the next slide, um, you know, there's, there's definitely a few things sort of categorically that I think, you know, everyone should be thinking about. Um, I will start with, uh, QSBS SOC, Qualified Small Business SOC. Um, if you don't, if you're not familiar with that as a concept, I mean, that's probably like the the, the biggest gimme in this whole thing. Uh, so just, you know, the ability to avoid, you know, um, really just considerable amounts of uh, uh, capital gains uh, taxes really starts with your understanding of, do you qualify, uh, you know, um, does your ownership qualify as small business stock? Um, and, uh, you know, if not, what do you need to do to uh, make sure you have that uh, that treatment? And then if you do have it, I mean, there's just a million things that you can do to just maximize the the benefit of that, whether it's, you know, uh, setting up, uh, you know, setting up uh, various different trusts uh, to sort of hold qualified small business stock and multiply the exemption that you can get. Uh, that's really super important. And um, again, sort of varies person to person in terms of what your what your sort of specific circumstances are. but um, that's that's just a big gimme. You know, we had two founders come into um, our investment bank uh, this year. Um, you know, they sort of had a LOI um, come out of the blue. They had not ever met with a financial advisor or with investment bank before. You know, we're talking to them about their deal. You know, we're talking about QSBS. And then, you know, lo and behold, uh, you know, they've been an S corp this whole time. <laughs> it's just like it's it's too late. And the and the looks on their faces when they just realize you know the the taxes that they're paying now versus what they're you know what they could have done if uh, they just planned for this years ahead you know that that would be uh, yeah I, I've just never seen people more bummed out so um, you know that's another just reason think about it as early as possible um, you know the other things that you know you can do to uh, just help yourself on taxes uh, thinking about uh, philanthropic giving um, early on. Uh, that's again, uh, that's that's an important one. And the other thing too is just thinking about um, your estate. Um, if you are going to sell your company for, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of uh, dollars, at some point, you know, uh, your it's it's going to be subject to estate tax. Um, and you know, to some extent that's unavoidable, but to another extent, you know, the earlier you plan for it now, the more you can do to sort of minimize those transfer taxes in the future. So um, everyone has a super, you know, uh, unique set of circumstances, but uh, just early, early planning it is the single best way to uh, mitigate some of those taxes. Um, the other thing, and I've I've kind of like, seen a, a lot of people ask about this recently is um you know moving to uh to avoid taxes you know whether that's uh hey i you know live in new york but maybe i want to move to florida or uh you know i've even gotten some people saying hey uh i'm about to sell my company i'm going to move to puerto rico <laughs> i'm like well like it doesn't like exactly work that way uh you can't just up and you know leave you know a month before you sell and then now you live in Puerto Rico and you're not going to pay capital gains tax. Um, if that's like, if that's part of your calculus, you think you might want to move, you need to do that years in advance. Um, so I think it's, it's just, you know, again, like all this comes down to, it's really important to plan. It's really important to plan early. And it's really important to say like exactly what you want to see happen. Um, and, you know, for me, you know, when I think about financial planning for any goal, you know, including having a successful transaction, it's, you know, understand what the goal is, achieve it as efficiently as possible, minimize your risks, uh, avoid behavioral errors. Um, that's what, that's what, you know, a financial advisor is going to do for you. And that's you know, also to, and a financial advisor who I think has advised people through this process before. Um, you know, I'm not talking about working with the guy who, you know, sells mutual funds to, uh, you know, to teachers in the Midwest. Um, you know, work with someone who understands this process. Uh, you know, there you can work with someone with, like myself, who's a certified exit planning advisor. Um, you know, that's a, 
uh, credential that's out there that says, hey, I uh, like truly understand this process and uh, you know, can add value in, uh, in planning for it. Um, I, yeah, I would say early, do it early and, uh, you know, just be super honest about what you want. Um, yeah. All right, Brian, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for that. Really, really useful and timely information. All right, uh, let's wrap it up. Uh, you can each take 30, 30 seconds and give us your final comments. Don? Wow. Um... <clears throat> I know it's like drinking from a fire hose, but what I would say is, you know, True North is creating a business that is um, well managed and welcome for an investor or buyer requires professional advice and assistance. I mentioned earlier on, it's like inviting someone to your home. And I have something called the cockroach theory that if, if you see one cockroach, you can assume there's hundreds more hiding. So you want to avoid those gotchas because uh, they can, you know, they can distract from the magic moment uh, when someone falls in love with your company and they want to invest or acquire. So preparation, what I call pre-wiring for success is key. And uh, the four of us in our respective uh, areas of specialty can help you do that. Don, thanks so much. Jeanette? I can probably find different words to say basically the same thing. I'll give it a try. But I just completely agree. You know, you got to plan, you got to prepare, and you have to have the right professionals in place that understand the process and how it works. Um, I just have seen so much added difficulty in those uh, deals where they want to use the attorney that wrote their will to close a sale of a business or you know, a tax accountant that's really just focused on doing small business tax returns and doesn't understand the broader implications of structuring a sale of a business on a broader scale. So just take the time to plan, cross your T's, dot your I's, get the right systems in place, provide accurate information, and bring the right people to the table to support you. Uh, uh, Brian, anything further thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, just, I agree with, uh, you know, with these guys, I, I think it's kind of, uh, you know, the way you do anything is the way that you do everything and just, uh, you know, being, being conscientious, uh, if, if you do, if you, you know, leave one area of it undone, it's, it's going to show up somewhere else. Um, and, you know, in my area, it's, it's, you know, a little less impactful on the actual deal, but just again, you know, what, what, what are you doing this for? It's, it's to you know, do something for yourself ultimately at the end of the day. So, um, you know, do it early, listen to the professionals and, uh, you know, just um, play, you know, understand what game you're playing, do what it takes to win that game. Great, Brian, thank you. I'm just gonna make a last point about transparency. You know, it, it really is important to be transparent and forthright that buyers will do a deep dive. Uh, if there are issues, Make sure you you know what those issues are and you're upfront with them. That's that's going to make a big difference in, in addressing them as you as the process plays out. All right. Well, listen. Thank you all, uh, Don, Jeanette, Brian. Uh, really, really useful. Lots of good information in a really short time frame. Um, we will be going to networking after this. Uh, so for the participants, you can go to the breakout rooms to talk to any of us. Uh, our contact information is in the chat. For me, you can uh, use my Calendly link. Uh, do take a look at the videos uh, on the Tech Alliance YouTube channel and on the events page of my firm website for past events. We will be distributing the video for this event as well. Uh, so keep an eye open for that. And with that, Doug, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Paul. And thanks to Don, Jeanette, Brian. I uh, really appreciate you guys being here and carving out uh, some time in your day. Uh, and thanks to everybody for joining us.